Environment and Energy at the Breakthrough Institute, the lead data scientist at ESSIS, and the chief scientist at C3.ai, as well as co-founder and chief scientist of Efficiency 2.0. Gavin Schmidt is the director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York and was the acting senior climate advisor to the NASA administrator during 2021. Gavin currently works on the simulation of climate in the past, present, and possible futures with the NASA GIST climate model and has over 150 peer-reviewed publications. He was author with Joshua Wolf of Climate Change Picturing the Science in 2009, and in 2011 was the inaugural re recipient of the American Geophysical Union Climate Communication Prize. So he's also a fellow of AGU and American Association for the Advancement of Science, and his 2014 TED Talk on climate modeling has been viewed over a million times. So I'm going to hand it off to Gavin and Zeke. Uh, and um, as we've done in the past, we'll take questions at the very end. Um, because we're on Zoom today, what you can do is you can either raise your hand, place a question in the chat. Um, but if you're joining us via the YouTube live stream, as always, just go to slido.com and enter your question in Slido. And then I will um, hand it over um, to Zeke and Gavin to provide an answer to your query at uh, the end of the presentation. Okay. So, uh, it's all yours. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, so Gavin and I uh, have not given this particular talk before and have not generally done a joint talk. Uh, <laughs> so we will be sort of passing it off between each other uh, as, as we I've, see that as we go through this. <laughs> yeah, I've never done a joint talk. So this is, uh, this is all uh, new for me. So feel free to take over entirely. No, no, no. Uh, feel, feel free to cut in. Uh, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll start by leading through the presentation and if you have thoughts on it, each slide, just, uh, you know, or feel free to take over the slide if you want. Anyway, uh, so the reason we're all here is to talk about uh, some of the work that, that Gavin and I led along with uh, Kate Marble and, and Mark Salinka and, and a number of the other folks um, in a commentary we published in Nature last year uh, around hot models uh, and assessed warming. And so as a bit of background for this uh, and the reason why we're concerned about these issues, um, well, actually to, to start with grounding ourselves, you know, we're gonna be spending a bit of time today uh, talking about some of the challenges with the latest generation of climate models, uh, but it's important to emphasize that more broadly, you know, climate models have been an incredibly effective tool in assessing uh, both historical and future warming. Um, and historically have done quite a good job at projecting warming in the years after they were published. So this is a figure uh, that was derived from a paper that Gavin and I published in 2020 uh, that also showed up in chapter one of the recent IPCC report, uh, effectively showing the uh, a subset of, of prominent climate model uh, models that were published uh, between the 1970s and the early 2000s um, and their global mean surface temperature projections. Uh, in the top plot, and then the observations, this is Hat Group 5, uh, in the real world. Uh, and then the bottom plot is a, a variation of, of that, but showing the change in temperature as a function of change in radiative forcing, uh, both in each of the models, their projected radiative forcing, and the observed radiative forcing in the real world. Well, <laughs> our best estimate of the third radiative forcing. Um, inferred, inferred radiative forcing. Inferred radiative forcing, yes. Um, and then the, the important... Uh, the importance of the bottom plot here is that you know you could have the best climate model in the world that simulated the atmospheric perf atmosphere perfectly in 1970. Not that anyone actually did, uh, but if you projected that we'd be at you know 480 parts per million CO2 today, your future projection of warming would be pretty far off. And so by comparing temperature change as a function of of change in radiative forcing, you can sort of normalize for potential mismatches in um, future emissions forecasts. Because because again, if you're evaluating climate models, you want to evaluate them on their physics, not on the crystal ball that the modeler happened to use for deciding how much coal society was going to be using in the year 2020. Um, so uh, start out. Pointing uh, out that all of these models here were using concentrations, not emissions, uh, because they didn't have climate, they didn't have carbon cycles within them. So it's estimates of, uh, of uh, 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 concentrations of, of uh, greenhouse gases that were the main driver. Yep. So this has also been generally true for past CMIP uh, ensembles. So, you know, this is Gavin's plots of the performance of CMIP 3 on the left, both for its hindcast and forecast, uh, and CMIP 5 on the right. Um, 
And you know, the, the general approach that the community has used in working with climate model data in the past has been to use a multi-model mean uh, across the ensemble, uh, as well as a spread across all the models uh, for a lot of various impact analyses and other things. Uh, and in the past, observations tracked reasonably well with the multi-model mean. There's a, some caveats there uh, on CMAP5, in part due to forcing mismatches that Gavin has published on, uh, as well as sort of some differences in the rate of sea surface temperature versus surface air temperature warming uh, that we've also done a few papers on in the past. Um, but the main takeaway here is that, you know, CMIP models, at least in CMIP 3 and CMIP 5, you know, we don't speak of CMIP 4, uh, <laughs> have tracked the multi-model mean pretty well uh, in the years after they've been published. Um, however, you know, when we got to CMIP 6, we had a few surprises. Uh, and Gavin, I don't know if you want to talk a bit about the sensitivity values we ended up seeing in CMIP 6. Well, yes. I mean, you know, people have seen this kind of figure before, I'm sure. Um, uh, these are the effective ECS uh, that were calculated by Mark Zelenko, which are all um, in his uh, GitHub uh, repository if you need to download them. Um, uh, and we noticed, I mean, as a community, Kind of early in what 2019 uh, that some of the uh, the very well respected models were starting to have uh, ECS values that were substantially outside the range of CMIT five and and uh, substantially outside the range of the uh, of what was coming out of the uh, the Sherwood et al uh, assessment and uh, obviously uh, folks at NCAR know where the NCAR models lie on this but uh, but some of the other high end ones uh, the DOE model uh, had CM um, had had gem uh, 3 in the UK ESM version of that uh, and the Canadian uh, climate center model version 5 um, uh, these are all good models and uh, and so i think we uh, we were a little bit uh, surprised that they came up with such high numbers. Um, and then as the database got filled in, uh, right now uh, there's like 52 models. I think there's still more models coming in. So uh, this might be a little bit out of date, but anyway, but 52 individual models, you know, it it filled out a little bit in the middle, but, but you can see that uh, uh, the spread compared to the spread in CMIP5, which was... Uh, uh, what 2.1 2 to 4.7, I think, in CMIP 5. Uh, it was, was, um, I think a little shocking. Uh, and uh, the constraints that uh, the IPCC assessed, uh, are similar to what Shoah did al uh, in 2020 assessed. Um, oh, you can go, yeah, yeah, yep. <laughs> uh, which, we'll, which we'll get to in a second. Um, uh, we can, you can go back Maybe one more. Oh. Sorry, um, I, you know, put the uh, the likely and very likely ranges um, well within the uh, the CMIP six um, uh, uh, kind of envelope, and uh, and that that means that we that that we that we now have an issue. Um, uh, it means that depending on how we weight the CMIP6 models, we're going to end up with things uh, that have average uh, ECSs or spreads of uncertainty in the future that are beyond what you would have said from observations alone. Okay. Yeah, to, to build on top of that a little bit, you know, in CMIP5, uh, and, and in the IPCC AR5, uh, we saw a pretty consistent range of sensitivity estimates between both models and the sort of the broader estimate uh, produced by the IPCC that, that accounts for a few additional lines of evidence besides just the CMIP models. Um, there's a little bit of disagreement on the low end. You know, the IPCC AR5 probably had their sensitivity range a bit too broad on the low end. There, there weren't any models, you know, below 2C ECS, uh, and they sort of made the claim you could have as, as low as 1.5C in, in the likely range. Um, but the two largely overlapped on the left side of this graph. Uh, but going into CMIP 6 and in the AR6 process, uh, we were in a very different world. So simultaneously, you had this much wider range of sensitivity in CMIP 6 models than we had in CMIP 5 models. So we have the red bar here compared to the late blue bar on the left. Um, and you had a bunch of new work being done by the community led by Steve Sherwood uh, that myself and Kate Marvel and a bunch of other folks participated in 
um, that tried to narrow this range of climate sensitivity, not just by using models, but a wider variety of evidence from observational records, from the paleoclimate uh, across different cool and warm periods in the, the distant past. Um, and the real insight of Sherwood et al. is that by combining these independent or mostly independent lines of evidence on climate sensitivity and using some Bayesian magic, you could get a much narrower joint distribution of climate sensitivity uncertainties than if you relied on any single line of evidence alone. And so the IPCC, um, you know, it's putting it a little blithely to say largely adopted, but the, the range of sensitivity that was assessed in the AR6 ended up being very similar to the range of sensitivity that was proposed in the Sherwood et al. paper. Um, and so that orange bar on the right is the likely and very likely uh, climate sensitivity range, um, 2.5 to 4 and 2 to 5 uh, that were respectively that were in the AR6. And so when you look at this graph, you see that there's a pretty big disconnect here. Uh, if the IPCC is assessing the likely range of climate sensitivity as, as 2.5 to 4 C per doubling CO2 or equilibrium climate sensitivity and the very likely range as 2 to 5, but there is a pretty sizable subset of SEMA of six models that are outside the very likely range of climate sensitivity assessed. Um, that's hard to square. Uh, and so this set up a bit of a dilemma for the authors of the AIR-6 report. How do you, you know, deal with these very differing um, results coming from the community assessment of climate sensitivity and from the new generation of models? You have anything on this one before I move on, Gavin? Okay, <laughs> so the IPCC tried to square the circle. Um, it turns out that, uh, and a number of papers in the lead up to the AIR-6 pointed this out, uh, that a number of the high sensitivity CMIP-6 models don't do a particularly good job at high casting temperatures. Um, a lot of them, because they have very high aerosol forcings, counterbalancing their very high sensitivity to CO2, uh, end up with uh, almost no warming over the 20th century and then this huge spike in the last couple decades when aerosols start declining and, and CO2 emissions continue to rise. Um, and it turns out those models that perform better at reproducing historical temperatures tend to have a equilibrium climate sensitivity value uh, that's more comparable to you know, the CFA5 models or the AR6 range. And so um, what the IPCC did is they used three different sets of uh, sort of constrained CMIP6 sensitivity ranges uh, from uh, Lang et al., from Rebs et al., from uh, Turkasa et al., uh, to uh, effectively weight CMIP6 models based on their performance in reproducing historical temperatures and provide a weighted estimate of future projections uh, across the different SSPs. Um, they averaged those three different uh, studies to get sort of a average weighted estimate of CMIP6 model projections. And then at the same time, they also used a emulator um, that was tuned to the Sherwood et al. sensitivity range in order to do a separate estimate of future warming projections, uh, global mean surface temperature warming projections. And then that produces the, this plot C synthesis, which is the emulator estimate and the constrained CMIP6 estimate. And then they average those two. So the average of three constraint studies and an emulate or that are averaged, and then the average of that is averaged with an emulator to produce what they call the assessed global surface air temperature warming projections. Uh, and these are what were actually shown in the summary for policymakers. They're highlighted in the, all the tables around, you know, when the world is going to pass various warming thresholds and generally propagated through much of the rest of the report. The problem is this confused almost everyone. <laughs> they didn't do a particularly good job of explaining, and no offense to the IPCC authors in, in the, the room, um, and, and chapter four did go into a lot of detail of this, but at the high level in the SPM, in, in other parts, this process was not explained particularly well um, and it was unclear how the community as a whole should then use the outputs of this process going forward to assess climate impacts, to assess everything else that we're looking at um, in the climate system. And so what's practically happened in a lot of cases is that folks have you know, done what they've previously done, which is use the multi-model mean and spread from CMIP-6, just like we did with CMIP-5. Uh, to assess, um, you know, future climate impacts and, and other uh, changes. And that has created this inconsistency between the way that CMIP models are being used by parts of the community and the way they were used in the IPCC um, that is potentially problematic. 
Yeah, let, let me let me kind of add a couple of things here. So um, nominally speaking, the uh, the process that was used by uh, the IPCC authors should have been in the supplemental material. Uh, but when the the report was published, the supplemental material was not complete, um, and it took like a good year for the for the supplemental material to arrive. Uh, and when we were writing the paper in uh, in, in 21. So this, we were trying to do this, I guess, at the, the beginning of that year. Um, I, we, we could not actually get a description of what was actually done beyond the, like the three lines that were in the chapter. Um, and so, uh, one of the things that we thought that we would be able to do would be to say, okay, well, you know, whatever they use to constrain the models, we could just apply that more generally and then provide a formula for that. Um, but that turns out to be, uh, it, it was not available. Um, and, uh, and when you actually see what they did, uh, the formula is, uh, is, 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 is totally opaque and not, um, <laughs> and not, uh, and not, and not easily, um, expressed in, in, in a way that you could use, uh, if for anything else. Mm -hmm. and, and it only produces a global mean surface temperature and, you know, through variations, ocean econ and other or time series, but it doesn't provide any gridded information of regional or other changes uh, that folks need for a lot of, of practical studies using mm -hmm. CMIP6. So there's not just a simple set of weights that you can apply to CMIP6 and get what the IPCC got. Um, and so, yeah, th this is just the highlighting the assessed warming projections that were in the summary for policymakers. And again, these are not based on the CMIP6 multimodal mean. These are based on this sort of bespoke combination of uh, observational constraint weights and a separate emulator tuned to the sensitivity values. Uh, and why does this matter? Well, it turns out that the assessed warming projections differ pretty substantially from what you'd get if you just use the CMIP6 multimodal mean. Um, these difference range from about 0.2 C warming by 2100 in uh, deep mitigation scenarios like SSP1 2.6, uh, to up to 0.6 C warming difference in 2100 in, in very high emission scenarios like SSP5 8.5. Uh, and so if the community ends up continuing to use the multimodal mean for assessments of, of future climate change, um, they're going to be exaggerating the amount of future warming compared to what the IPCC assessed. Um, and so we and not, want not to just in the mean, right? I think it's important to note that the tails go way higher, right? So if you look at the SS585 uh, tail, right, you've got, you know, within your spread, you have a uh, warming of greater than seven degrees. That's an insane amount of warming and is... Uh, you know, I mean, uh, what is that? One, two, three, you know, it's it's more than 50% warmer than uh, you would get from the assessed warming. And so that has enormous implications uh, if that was real. So. Yep. Uh, and so what we wanted to provide in our nature commentary was a way for the community to more easily replicate the global mean surface temperature change results of the AR6 assessed warming approach um, while maintaining, you know, the gridded nature of the CMIP6 product, so you can use it for various impact assessments and other things. Um, and later in the talk, we'll get to the various options we propose for that. But, but one thing that we did propose uh, that'll be relevant for the next few slides is potentially screening the models based on their TCR. Uh, and it turns out that the very likely range, or sorry, the likely range of TCR in um, the AR6 uh, if you screen based on that metric, you do a pretty good job of reproducing the air six assessed warming at a global level. And so that's a very simple thing that people can do of saying this model's in, this model's out and use a multi-model mean based on that screening. It's not perfect. Ideally, we would not want to throw away any models. <laughs> and there are very good reasons to keep specific models for specific assessments, um, particularly outside of temperatures or even you know, for different regions, other models might perform better. So we're not trying to claim that we should you know, throw out all the hot models and never use them. But when you're trying to look at global mean surface temperature changes and sort of trying to assess impacts in a way consistent with the IPCC's <clears throat> assessed warming, then a TCR screen is a relatively straightforward way to do that. So um, this is also just highlighting that the surface temperature observations have been running notably lower than the CMIP6 multimodal mean, both in the hindcast in uh, previous decades and in the forecast period, um, where the CMIP6 models are using projected future forcings. Um, this is less true uh, if we look at the TCR screen subset, which is shown in red here. 
Um, so there still is a little bit of a mismatch. Yeah. Well, so, uh, you know, and then some of the mismatches that we've seen in previous CMIP uh, exercises, whether they were, um, you know, related to forcing uh, that was, was, I think, particularly notable in CMIP 5, um, or related to the difference between uh, what's in something like GIST temp and, and had uh, crew T5 um, and what the model SAT trends are. So if you use a, a blended project, uh, a blended um uh, product that uses SST over the ocean and SAT uh, over the land and and sea ice, uh, then uh, you, um, uh, you 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 reduce the mismatch uh, by about uh, 0 0.05 uh, degrees C in 2020. So uh, so part of uh, part of the comparison here, uh, you still need to think about those things. They're not huge, uh, but the the point to be made is that the uh, is that the models, the multi-model mean and spread uh, have already diverged from the observations. Um, and uh, if we go to the next slide, um, I, I did the same thing for the uh, sea surface temperature uh, trend. So that's uh, two estimates of the sea surface temperature trends. Uh, the same uh, TCR screening for the uh, for the pink um, uh, band, uh, and then the 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 gray band is is all of the models. Um, and what I was doing here was I was using each individual model uh, uh, to, to calculate the spreads, right? So all of the ensemble members uh, without any um, a reduction per model. Um, and it turns out that almost all of the uh, high uh, transient, the, the, the models that are warming uh, much faster in the transients, uh, even in the modern period, um, they're almost all the Canadian models. Uh, so uh, the Canadian model uh, put in um, 50 uh, standard ensemble members into the archive, and then there's three um, ensemble members that are with their carbon cycle but have the same climate sensitivity. Uh, and all of the trends uh, you can see in the in the bar graph uh, that are uh, effectively above 0.2 degrees C per decade, they're all from one single model. Um, and the uh, and that 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 is <laughs> that is that is a real distortion uh, to the um, uh, to the histogram. Uh, if you look at the TCR screened histogram, right, which is the red bars um, uh, in that uh, in that histogram, uh, you can see that they're almost all totally compatible with the trends that we see in the observational products. Um, and you don't have any. There's no there's no issue here with um, uh, mismatches of exactly what's being measured. We're measuring the SST, and we're and we're um, and we're looking at the SST in the, in the models. Um, so the SST in the TCR screen models is is behaving very appropriately, uh, but but there are uh, noticeably like the Canadian model, um, and then some of those grayed out areas, uh, those those are the other high end models um, uh, are are really skewing the ensemble. <clears throat> Um, this one's this one's mine as well, so I'll, so I'll take that. And and you know, and it makes a difference to the uh, the model uh, observation mismatches um, in trends. I, you know, I tried to capture here. This was this was I made this figure in response to um, uh, a rather poor paper uh, that appeared in in GRL where. Uh, they didn't take into account any of the ensemble variants um, in the models um, and only compared uh, the uh, ensemble mean from each model uh, to an exact estimate of the of the ERA5 um, trends um, and then concluded that uh, that no model above uh, with an ECS above three was compatible. Uh, that's that was not true uh, that claim, um, but you do need to worry about the ensemble spread. I mean, so so even for this is you know thirty year trends effectively, uh, there's a lot of spread um, in the models, uh, and you have to. Uh, you know, it's it's good that people are putting in large ensembles. Uh, I think that's that's a that's a great in, innovation that we've uh, that we've adopted. I think collectively, um, uh, but there is a clear uh, increase in the model observation mismatch uh, as you go towards the uh, the higher ECS. Um, models. Um, the uh, the big long string of um, uh, of models right at the top there is again the Canadian models, which um, uh, which don't come anywhere close to the observed change. Uh, 
Uh, I apologize for any any Canadians that might be walking among us right now. <laughs> Um, and as Gavin said, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing that we are seeing a diversity of model results. We don't want everyone to herd or to, you know, overly constrain their model to match historical temperatures. Um, the problem, though, is that if we use all of these models equally and take a mean across all of them, we end up with a, a skewed overall result. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it's also worth noting that there wasn't this apparent correlation between uh, the historical warming uh, rates and uh, ECS in CMIP5. Uh, it seems to have come out very much in the CMIP6 uh, set of models. Yeah, I, I mean, to, to, to mm -hmm. just, yeah, I mean, to kind of, can I add to the, the general point, um, there's a lot to be gained from having a large spread of models, right? It becomes much easier to do emergent constraints. Um, if all the models are correct, you can't segregate them. You can't look at a, a relationship that is a kind of a meta model relationship. Um, and so there's there's a lot of reason to uh, to maintain uh, this kind of uh, this kind of spread. Um, but uh, uh, you know, we we I think we fell into a bad habit, right? So we we used as a heuristic the model pdf uh, the model histogram as if it was a pdf in previous versions and and i recall many people saying yeah no it's a model histogram it's not really the pdf and everyone else saying yeah it doesn't matter uh because it turned out that the spread of the ecs in the models was very close to the uh to the overall assessed rate and so it, it didn't really matter so uh in practical terms even though you know philosophically and statistically it made no sense uh it was fine uh but what's happened now is that uh the larger spread in cmip6 has made it clear that that there really is an issue in trying to do that um and so we really need to move on to a more sophisticated uh, approach and how to deal with it so which cues up the next slide yep uh so <laughs> This title is, is a little uh, flippant, but uh, you know, effectively, the IPCC killed model democracy, but didn't tell anyone. Um, and so, as, as we mentioned earlier, you know, the assessed warming uh, that the IPCC proposed differs pretty significantly from the CMIP6 multi-model means. Um, you know, that's 0 0.2 to 0 0.7. Sorry, I misspoke earlier. Uh, warming differences by 2100. Um, but the assessed warming projections that were provided in the IPCC were only provided as annual uh, global mean surface temperature fields or annual ocean heat content fields, uh, or not fields, annual global mean temperature time series. Um, no gridded products consistent with IPCC assessed warming projections were available to the community. Um, and you know, as we mentioned earlier, the whole assessed warming process and how it was done was not necessarily communicated the best to the broader scientific community. A lot of people to our, in our experience, were somewhat unaware of this issue and this mismatch. Um, and so as a result, some people kept using CMIP6 multimodal means like they did for prior CMIP generations uh, in a way that is inconsistent with the approach the IPCC took. And as Gavin reminds me, it is some, we can't necessarily say most, um, because no one has done uh, any sort of comprehensive survey of, of how people are actually using the new models. And some of, some of this is anecdotal based on, on our experience, but certainly there have been a lot of papers published showing, you know, X variable is happening in CMIP6 in a way it didn't happen in CMIP5, which, you know, the result in, in many of those cases is almost entirely due to the difference in global mean surface temperature response or regional temperature response in CMIP6 versus CMIP5 as a result of the inclusion of these very high sensitivity models. Uh, so yeah, um, we uh, published this piece in uh, Nature last year um, that we think got a decent amount of attention, um, definitely trying to uh, walk the tightrope a bit in communicating this to the broader scientific community and not saying that, you know, models are bogus or models are bad or models don't work, but rather that, you know, we have this big ensemble in CMIP6 and some of them seem more consistent with observations um, and other estimates of the sensitivity of the climate than others. And so that treating them all as equal um, doesn't necessarily work very well anymore. Uh, and we as a community need to figure out alternative approaches to use in assessing CMIP6 that differ a bit in the ways that we assessed few, uh, previous generations of models. Yeah, and you know, and about the time this was coming out, people were doing, uh, you know, kind of 
you know, do quick and easy analyses of the CMIP6 uh, models. And obviously, you know, a lot of people here will be aware of how uh, models have been treated by the uh, the climate contrarian community, and uh, you know the the uh, uh, the efforts to to diminish the skill that they do show. Um, and so there are a lot of people that were that were showing um, the CMIP six ensemble uh, without any consideration of these other constraints, and uh, and then kind of having that add to the uh, the mantra that uh, that all climate models. Um, are running too warm and so we should discount everything that climate models um, uh, do and so what we're trying to do here is really not feed that narrative but like kind of uh, you know counter that narrative because I, th there's still a lot of skillful models and there's been a lot of skillful models in in uh, in the past um, but if we don't if we didn't deal with uh you know the raw cmip6 ensemble then you know we're going to end up with a situation where you know lots and lots of people will be uh tarring the whole of the uh the modeling effort based on uh what turns out to be you know specific outliers uh and so that was that was part of why we uh we we embarked upon this uh this particular paper um, and so in the paper, we suggested a number of different paths forward for the community to take in using CMIP6 models that either avoids this problem of, uh, you know, some potentially too hot outliers or uses them in a way that's more consistent with the air six assess warming. Um, and, you know, we can talk about these a lot more in the discussion, but, but broadly speaking, you know, the recommendations we gave is, is one to use global warming levels when assessing climate impacts, um, somewhat independent well, of climate. Mm -hmm. Which, to be clear, had been suggested by AR6. I mean, and uh, yes. and I think Richard Betts uh, was the first person to suggest that that's how we should be looking at these things. So that wasn't that wasn't um, uh, that wasn't original to us. I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Richard, Richard, I think what was it, 2007, 2011? It was it was a while back. He had suggested a similar approach, um, and it turns out that the results across global warming levels, uh, at least for temperature and, and a few other variables, are, are relatively insensitive to model TCR or ECS. So if you take you know, all the different CMIP6 models when the global mean surface temperature hits four degrees C above pre-industrial, and you look at the sort of, regardless of when exactly that occurs uh, in each model, and you look at, you know, the distribution of temperatures or some of these other variables, they're, they're generally pretty consistent. Um, there's not a huge difference between high and low ECS models um, for variables at, at the same global warming level. Uh, and one nice thing about global warming levels is they can also be used you know, in, in more of a, a communication sense to account for a wider range of climate system uncertainties than SSP multimodal means. Like, I, I feel like as a community, a lot of times you get overly constrained by the choice of SSPs, when in reality, if you're looking at, say, a 4C warming world, you can get there with, you know, the low end of SSP 58.5, the central outcome of SSP 37.0, or the high end of, you know, SSP 24.5, if you get really unlucky with sensitivity and carbon cycle feedbacks. And so global warming levels let you the outcome space uh, a little bit more in, in the way you communicate them. Uh, and this is also something that's been adopted to a reasonably large extent. It's, it's still a bit of an ongoing battle in uh, the fifth national climate assessment um, as, as the way we get a bunch of these different impacts. Um, but part of it is, is a chicken and egg issue because as there is not as much of a literature on impacts at global warming levels today and more of an in, a literature on impacts in specific SSPs, you know, you're going to have to, or RCPs, um, you're going to have to rely on, on what's out there until we get more studies that, that look at global warming levels explicitly. Uh, the ones that have generally been used are 1.5, 2, 3, and 4, um, though there's some variations there. Uh, the other approach that we discussed earlier uh, is screen models based on TCR or ECS uh, and use a subset consistent with the AR6 likely range. Um, both TCR and ECS screens provide pretty similar results, but the TCR screen results in fewer models being discarded. Uh, I think we end up keeping roughly two thirds of the CMIP6 ensemble uh, with the TCR screen. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, it provides multi-model mean uh, global mean surface temperatures that are consistent with the air 6 assess warming, but also lets you actually use all of the data in those models that are, are retained, um, including you know, the gridded fields and all that sort of stuff that you don't get with the air 6 assess warming approach. Uh, and then finally, you know, for, for many of the folks in the room listening to this, um, you know, if you're actually doing a specific study for a specific region across specific variables of interest, 
then screening what models you use based on global mean surface temperature response might not necessarily be the most useful thing for you to do. Um, and researchers you know, have and can create sort of bespoke weights or emerging constraints specific to what they actually want to look at for those models. Because it turns out that even if you know, the Canadian model is crazy high sensitive and, and has super high warming rates, it might do a really good job of matching the current you know, precipitation climatology you know, across Northern Africa, or you know, might do a particularly good job of matching historical um, cloud or rainfall uh, behaviors in, in certain parts of the world. And so, you know, there's there's always a bit of a trade-off, particularly based on on how much you care about the future projections of that model. Um, but you know, it's worth saying that many of the high sensitivity models are quite skillful at other variables in the climate system and, and climatologies. So let, to, to add to that a little bit, I mean, I, you know, we've we've been discussing, I think, as a community, uh, issues with moral democracy for a long time, right? So Rado Nudi has written uh, multiple papers on that. Um, uh, we've uh, uh, we've contributed to, uh, the, the, I mean, there was a uh, there was a um, a workshop at NCAR uh, ages ago, uh, I think pre pre AR five uh, that uh, that came up with the uh, best practices for dealing with the multimodal ensemble. Um, uh, and that literature is is very like non-committal um, about what one should do, uh, because it turned out that <clears throat> with with the CMIT five models, there wasn't um, a nice formula that one could use based on some you know metric of choice uh, that would lead to robust results um, that were then uh, you know. Uh, 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 that, that gave you uh, significantly different um, uh, projections. Uh, and, in, and in most of the cases uh, in the CMIT-5 ensemble, when people did a bespoke weighting, uh, what you ended up with was, um, uh, you know, a mean projection that was very similar to the multimodal mean. Uh, and that was because it turns out that most of the skill metrics that people were using to base their weights on were actually uncorrelated to the uh, the projections, right? So to the, the sensitivity of the models in, in whatever variable uh, did not turn out to be uh, very highly correlated to uh, the skill of that variable in the seasonal mean or in the interannual variability or the climatology. Um, and so uh, there, there was a lot in the literature um, uh, of, of bespoke weighting uh, that had very little impact with, a, with one or two exceptions, um, uh, very little impact on, on what would, one would actually project. Um, but but the situation in CMIP six is totally different. Uh, so now bespoke weights, if they're correlated effectively to uh, the TCR or the ECS, um, uh, they will give you very different results. And and uh, so that means that we need to be much more careful in in in, in doing this. And we need to be uh, we need we need a lot more work, I think, uh, to uh, to work out exactly what it is that one should do. Uh, if that's what you, if that's what you want to do, yep. Uh, and then finally, you know, before we kick it over to discussion, I you should mention that we're not making a claim here that there's no chance that ECS is above five. Um, in fact, if you look at Sherwood at all, it's probably somewhere in the like a little bit below ten percent chance, uh, or five to five to ten percent chance. Um, and so, if you want to look at outcomes very high sensitivity, but you know, we should be using these high sensitivity models to do those assessments. Um, the problem be is not that they exist. The problem is that they are skewing the ensemble when we take this model democracy approach of averaging everything together. Um, but yeah, I think that's all the slides we have. Uh, oh, no, we have one more oh, no. slide. Oh, no, there's one more slide. Yep, yes, sorry. Yes. Um, uh, so I, I, I added this because, uh, of course, there are issues with all of these things. Um, uh, one of the issues uh, associated with the uh, IPCC approach, which used the historical temperature record and matches to the historical temperature record, uh, is that that basically assumes that the forcings are OK. Um, but we know that that forcings have got uncertainty too. You know, we've um, the folks at uh, the NCAR, John Fasulo um, uh, et al, um, have identified an issue with the biomass burning uh, forcing, which uh, was like kind of decadally averaged uh, for the first part of it, and then uh, and then switched to monthly resolution, uh, which led to much greater 
uh, variants, which led to in models with uh, high sensitivity to uh, to aerosols, uh, led to uh, to a noticeable um, anomalous warming uh, just because the time scale of the biomass burning field had changed. Um, and so uh, that turns out to be about a 0 0.2 uh, issue, 0 0.2 of a degree issue in the 2020s for CESM2, um, uh, but it was not. Um, uh, but it, it turned out not to be a, an issue for for, for GIS. Uh, but I think it is also an issue for the um, uh, for the uh, for the E three SM model um, uh, as well. Um, we also know that that the the the, the broader aerosol and short lived climate forcing uh, data sets um, are under continual revision. Like so, uh, the SEDS folks uh, updated their model uh, their estimates of aerosol emissions to 2019 last year. They'll uh, they'll update them again uh, through to the end of 2021 in the next couple of months. Uh, but those are uh, revisions of the whole time series uh, starting from the pre-industrial. They're not just uh, revisions for the for the subsequent years. And there are systematic differences in uh, aerosol and short-lived climate forces um, that are being uh, put in there. So uh, anything that, that uses a, a fit to the historical data, there is a danger of overfitting uh, because you're kind of squeezing out some of the, um, uh, the, the true uncertainty in the, uh, in the forcings. Um, uh, the other uh, the other part of that, of course, is if your model uh, was tuned to the historical trends, which I've always contended was a bad idea, um, I, then you can't then use a screen based on historical trends to include or not include that model, right? It's it's that's. Uh, that that is uh, that's double dipping um, in some sense, and so uh, since we don't really have a great idea to how you know each of the different modeling groups uh, uh, took that or, or did that, um, I know some models definitely didn't. I know some models uh, did, uh, but I don't have a general sense of what people are doing. So so there, the IPCC approach um, again is a little bit um, problematic. Um, the uh, the other problems with the the, the global warming levels um, is that if you're interested particularly in uh, impacts of aerosols, uh, then you know for any particular global warming level, say two degrees, uh, there are models that are two degrees uh, that have. Um, uh, a lot of greenhouse gases and not very much aerosols and vice versa, less greenhouse gases and more aerosols, uh, but they're at the same global mean temperature change. Uh, and so you're kind of uh, disappearing the impact that one might get from changes uh, in, in aerosols on their own. Um, and so uh, it's not a huge effect, um, uh, but for things like, uh, you know, precipitation, um, it might be a, uh, a bigger effect than, uh, than people uh, might be, uh, than, it, might, it might be too big to, to ignore. Um, uh, the other issue with the with the global warming levels is that there is actually quite a difference in the statistics of uh, extreme events. If you have a period when uh, this is a twenty year period where there's uh, a very large uh, warming, right? So you have like a number of years at the end which are which are quite warm, with years at the beginning which are which are less warm, and so the if you look at ex the the um, uh, the number of thresholds that get exceeded or the number of extreme events, uh, you get a different answer if you've got a very steep trend than if you had a very flat trend. Um, and so I think if we're going to move to global warming levels as a generic kind of approach to looking at the uh, at the multimodal mean, uh, we need to be doing more uh, stabilized um, uh, stabilized experiments at the different uh, temperature levels. Uh, so uh, I, I think that that's something that is 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 going to be an issue, uh, but hasn't really been looked at uh, yet. Um, and then you know, there's I, I just want to throw this out there. 
uh, because uh, it's something that, that's being discussed uh, in a lot of other venues, um, is uh, the very rapid growth in the skill and ability of machine learning models to, uh, to look at climate projections and to, uh, and to um, produce diagnostics that are in between any of the run scenarios. Um, one thing that I think we might want to consider um, is uh, for the GCMs to not run specific scenarios, but to run uh, marker uh, projections uh, at particular temperatures um, uh, or with particular kinds of emissions, and then use or start to use uh, machine learning to create time varying scenarios uh, uh, by, you know, learning what the patterns are and then filling them in um, using uh, machine learning. Because, we, you know, we, we can't possibly run all the different scenarios uh, that one that, that, that people can think of. And, of course, all the scenarios that we're run, uh, they're, you know, these were designed uh, over 10 years ago uh, and don't include things like the impacts of um, uh, the impacts of the of the pandemic, uh, the technology changes have already overtaken uh, some of the assumptions um, in those scenarios, um, as have you know estimates of coal use and population and the like. Uh, and so, uh, maybe we need to uh, work as a as a climate modeling community to kind of divorce ourselves from the scenario uh, community, so that we so that we can do a lot more work with much different scenarios rather than just uh, focus on the uh, the four classes of scenarios that we've been doing more recently. Okay, so um, with that, uh, I'm, I'm happy to turn it over to questions and, and discussion. Uh, did you want to add anything, Zeke? Nope, uh, you did a great job. <laughs> so did you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, let's open it up to questions. Uh, if you have a question, you can either type it into the chat uh, or you can raise your hand, which Jerry just did. So yeah, please unmute. Yeah, thanks. Uh, great uh, tag team talk there. That was uh, very informative. Um, and I was just uh, wondering if you could say a little bit more about your TCR screening methodology, because that seems to a lot of your results seem to hinge on that methodology to come up with a, a screen set subset. Oh, it's not it's not a methodology. I mean, we just calculate we just used the calculated TCR and uh, got rid of everything that was uh, below 1.5 or above 2.2. Oh, OK, well, that's pretty straightforward. Yes, that, yeah, that was yeah. the point. We were trying to find we were trying to find the simplest thing that we could do that matched what the uh, what the IPCC had much more complicatedly done. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, Margaret, and then uh, Peter put one in the chat. So we'll get to that next. Um, yeah. Hi. Thank you guys so much for your talk. Yeah. Sorry, I was having a hard time finding the raise hand button there. Um, okay. I guess. I wanted to ask you about this constraint on ECS based on TCR, um, because I think there's been some work done that if you look at uh, the mean state cloud errors, uh, you would get the opposite constraint uh, in models. Um, uh, and so, so I guess to me that suggests that you know, is did you guys look at other things, right? Like, is this robust, right? You're using temperature and TCR based constraints, but I think, I think, I guess, I guess I don't have any reason to think that that's robust against kind of other other kinds of constraints. Um, do you want to comment on that? Um, you know, so you know, I mean, uh, I mean, we've we've you know, my 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 group has has done work on uh, on cloud related constraints, so emergent constraints that come from uh, the cloud state, and they uh, and they point to um, mean climate sensitivities uh, that are higher than the mean of the TCR weighted uh, cases. Um, I, that's very interesting. I'm I'm happy to that people uh, are doing that. Um, but you will end up uh, in those situations um, uh, having a uh, a projection that will be uh, that will be quite different from maybe not that different maybe, maybe quite different from the uh, uh, from the IPCC uh, assessed warming. Uh, now I don't know that that's wrong. 
Um, but it is something that you need to be aware of, right? So that when we're uh, when we're um, you know comparing uh, what we're producing in in new papers with you know what the community thinks, uh, you know we ha we have to be a little bit more careful, I think, about how to do that. I, 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 our point here is not to uh, discourage people from using other kinds of weightings or. Um, uh, or, or assessments, um, uh, but just to uh, a help people match what the IPCC did, um, and then help people think about uh, what different weightings would mean. Yeah, I mean, as Gavin mentioned, the TCR constraint was selected largely because it easily allows people to reproduce the air six assist warming projections, um, and you know. As part of that, you know, also gives something similar to what you'd get with the Air Six approach of using either historical temperature constraints uh, or sort of the Sherwood et al. type um, range of sensitivity from from these different lines of evidence. So, you know, that that is one class of constraints one could use. There are other constraints one could argue for. Again, there are large enough uncertainties in, in all of this that we're not trying to say that it has to be this. Uh, we're just saying that if you want to be consistent with what the Air Six did. This is a, a fairly easy way to do that. Um, there's also generally pretty close alignment between the results of a TCR constraint and the ECS constraint. Um, I think of all the models, only CSM2 kind of breaks that, having a very reasonable TCR and a very high ECS. Um, but most others, they're, they're pretty strongly correlated. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, I have a follow-up, but Monica, I'll let you uh, keep moving and call on me if... Uh... There's time. Oh, I think we'll probably have time because I'm only seeing one other question. So go for it. Um, okay. So I guess maybe maybe you could make the case to me of why one would want to kind of uh, constrain their models to look like AR6, um, right? I mean, you mentioned like not wanting to tune too much to observations, but to me, that seems way more reasonable than tuning to AR6 or Sherwood, which are estimates of projections that we don't even know the answer to. So, so maybe you can make it make make a case for that. Well, to well, me. Okay, so I, I'm not, I'm not making I'm not making a case that anybody should tune their models to the uh, IPCC assessed um, range. I'm saying that we should, uh, if you wanted to make a projection or an impact, uh, you might want to have it be coherent with what the assessed warming in AR6 was, which is not the same thing at all. I'm not. I I'm I am very. Uh, anti people tuning to uh, specific values of the uh, of the climate sensitivity because I don't think it's um, constrained well enough for, for that to be valid. Uh, and so, um, I, I, if if I gave that if we gave that impression, then that would that's that's wrong. That's not, that's not what I think. All right. Well, fair enough. Thank you. Okay. Okay, yeah. thanks. So um, we have one coming in the chat and then Isla, I'll get to you. Uh, so Peter Lawrence asked, I was wondering about what this implies for transient climate response to cumulative emissions, TCRE, not just the slope of the transient response, but also in the linearity, non-time dependence of the response. Um, I don't think it would have any huge implications for that. So the, so the range in the AR6 itself is based on similar exercise to what they use for assessed warming, to my knowledge. Um, it's not based on the multimental mean or anything like that uh, in CMIP 6. And so using a TCR screened approach or other approach consistent with the AR6 assessed warming would also generally give you a, a TCR relationship and your results consistent with what the IPCC had for their you know 1.65, uh, I don't remember the uncertainty ranges off the top of my head, uh, degree C per uh, petagram carbon. Um, in terms of the linearity, it, it's an interesting question. Um, I haven't seen an analysis across CMIP6 of TCRE. I imagine that there might be some more challenges in the linearity of that measurement in the high sensitivity models, particularly in the models whose sort of uh, with large differences between transient climate response and ECS, where there's sort of additional feedbacks that kick in that accelerate warming in the future. Um, but it's not something I've really looked into particularly. Um, but I, but I think for most purposes, we can just treat it as, as linear, uh, as a shorthand and, uh, you know, deal with the, the edge cases. I, I think there's a, there's a broader issue, uh, particularly uh, associated with the, um, with the global warming levels, uh, of things that have a long time scale, right? So, uh, global warming levels, uh, 
you know, if you're looking at a two degree world and it's happened very quickly or it's happened uh, longer, you're going to have um, a different uh, time scale of response, perhaps in the overturning stream function in the North Atlantic uh, or in um, uh, circulation changes in the Southern Ocean, you know, places that have uh, long memories uh, then, or, you know, I mean, or, you know, when we start coupling these models to, to ice sheets and things, um, it's, it makes quite a difference as to whether, you know, that two degrees happened in 10 years or whether it happened over a century for the response of these uh, uh, long, uh, long time constant uh, things. And I think that that is a real limitation on the GWL um, approach, uh, but I don't have a, um, I don't have a great answer for how to fix that yet. I, I think that that's something that, uh, uh, that people are going to have to uh, dig into um, independently. Okay, thank you. So Isla, and then uh, we'll finish up with Dave's question after Isla. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering about the emulator approach that you mentioned and how broadly that could be used. Did, will it work for kind of higher order statistics, like probability mm -hmm. of extremes and things like that? I, th I think so. Um, so I've, I've been looking at, um, I've been spending, you know, quite a bit of time looking at the, uh, the AI advances. Um, I, there's, uh, there seems to be a quite good skill uh, with the emulators um, uh, of producing uh, maps of, uh, of change. Uh, you might have seen the, uh, the forecast net uh, efforts out of NVIDIA where, you know, they're, uh, you know, they take initial conditions and they can, they can reproduce the ERA5 um, uh, weather uh, patterns. I, that doesn't, that, that, that isn't quite something that you can just apply to um, uh, climate projections uh, as yet, because the climate projections are way outside the training data of something like ForecastNet. But one could imagine uh, that you could do something a little bit like that. There was quite a nice paper uh, by Watson Paris et al. Uh, that came out last year, uh, where they uh, assessed the ability to do um, interpolation of uh, scenarios using an emulator approach. Um, I think you could go further with that. And I think it would depend on what you were giving it. So if you if you were uh, if you were going to give it, you know, like the high resolution, high frequency diagnostics from the uh, from the scenarios, uh, I think that you may have uh, quite a, a, a good possibility of being able to uh, interpolate between uh, the uh, the scenarios in terms of what that would give you. Um, uh, that's something that we're exploring, so I don't know that it's going to work, uh, but I think it's certainly a very um, uh, it's certainly a very uh, tempting uh, target. So, okay. thanks. Hey, um, and Dave. Yeah, I feel like I should stick up for my countrymen. Um, but <laughs> so, 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 what I'm wondering is, you know, there's there's some sort of physical reason in the model why it's getting really big climate sensitivity. You know, so has anybody looked into the Canadian model? We did it a little bit in CSM to sort of understand, well, why did all of a sudden we got like a real high climate sensitivity? But I'm wondering, can you then use that in addition to the TCR sort of cutoffs to say, well, you know, this was a bug. <laughs> and and so let's throw that one out. You know, I mean, I mean something like that you know, in addition to just this sort of TCR criteria. Right, right. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to say there is a bug in a model, therefore we should throw it out. Right. Uh, there are bugs <laughs> in all of them, right? Uh, they're just bugs that we have found, and then there are bugs that we have not yet found. Right. Right. Um, and, uh, and sometimes you think these things are of like huge significance and then it turns out they, they don't really matter very much at all. Uh, and then other things you change and suddenly it has this massive effect and you, you're wondering exactly why that is. Uh, so that's part and parcel of the, of the climate model development uh, process. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to prejudge, you know, what, what the Canadians uh, are doing to look at that. Um, what we do know is that the climate sensitivities uh, are very uh, tightly coupled to uh, Southern Ocean cloud feedbacks. Um, almost all of the increase in the uh, sensitivity uh, comes from that. Absolutely massive differences between uh, what the high ECS models in CMIP6 give and what the CMIP5 models show. That was that was uh, clear in uh, Mark Zelinka's work um, in, in 2020. Um, 
Um, we know that there are issues in Southern Ocean clouds. We know that they are not uh, thick enough uh, or there's not enough of them. Uh, we know that the, there are big shortwave um, uh, errors there. We know that the surface temperatures are too warm, not just in the climatology, but also uh, in the trends. Uh, you know, part of that could be um, you, you know, we're not we're not including uh, enough of the anomalous freshwater that's coming off the continents, right? So we've got some experiments that show that 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 is a um, uh, that contributes to to the uh, the ongoing bias in the SST patterns uh, in CMIP six, uh, and that cools the climate a little bit, right? So. Um, you know, are those uh, are those issues that uh, you know? I mean, did, did, you know, maybe maybe if you include all these things, the, the the temperatures don't go wild, the southern oceans feedbacks don't increase, and in fact, the models are fine. Right? Um, I I I don't know that. I I, I don't think that that's quite true. Yeah. But, so, uh, but you know, there's there's still a lot of uncertainty in the um, in the southern ocean clouds, um, and one of the things is that there may have been some overfitting. Uh, to uh, what people perceived to be the phase, the mixed phase uh, cutoffs for um, uh, for clouds, right? So there was an early paper, Hu et al., uh, that looked at the Calypso data uh, that came up with this histogram, uh, well, this kind of cumulative probability of of, uh, of ice versus water in the clouds. Uh, and it turns out that that isn't actually what we should be applying to the models because of the way that the satellites view um, solid precipitation, um, uh, not just not just cloud, um, and how we do the forward model of what's being seen by the satellite. Uh, once you include both the precipitation amounts and the forward modeling of things, then you actually get quite a different histogram, um, and that's the one that we should have been tuning the models to. And so, so some. Some of the CMIP five to CMIP six change came about because some groups, I think, were were, were misusing that target, um, and then that gives them uh, too much of a phase shift, and then that affected their well, it reduced their negative cloud feedback, uh, forcing their model to have a warmer, uh, a, a higher cloud feedback. So it's a very complicated um, story, and uh, you know, it's enough. Uh, it's enough of a job just to work out what's going on in one model, let alone the entire ensemble. And so uh, I, I look forward to your countrymen uh, coming up with a, a, an explanation on their own <laughs> for yeah. what's going on there. And uh, just to add to that really quick before we go, um, you know, it's not a problem if there's a couple of models that have an ECS of 5.5 or 5.7, because, you know, we can't rule that out, right? The, the problem is that 10% of the models have that, which then skews right. the ensemble. Um, and so... You know, again, Ken ESM isn't a problem that it exists. It's just we want to make sure that we're treating the models in a way that is consistent across the ensemble with other lines of evidence we have. Okay. Yeah, it's a, a good pace to finish. Yes, thank you. Because, um, yeah, we're a little bit over the hour. Um, so thank you, Gavin, Zeke, uh, for that great talk. Um, and uh, CGD, I'll see you back here. Uh, well, in the main seminar room uh, next week. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, and if there's any other questions, you know, we're